everybody uses but is really really cool. So what we're going to do tonight is give you an introduction to what polar polarimetry is first before we give you our really cool science talks because our science talks feature polarimetry in them and so we don't want you to be lost when we get there. Um, so if you guys are um, not too drunk yet you <laughs> will probably remember in high school learning about lights and learning that it's a wave. Um, and so what that means is that it has an electric field and a magnetic field that vibrate or oscillate or wiggle perpendicular to each other. Um, and it moves as it moves forward. <laughs> So normally, uh, light from a star or light from uh, any source is what we call unpolarized. And what that means is that the, the wiggles that the light is doing, they're all randomly oriented. So as the light is coming towards you, it can be wiggling vertically, it can be wiggling horizontally, and it can be wiggling at every angle in between there. But sometimes, something happens to the light that causes it to be polarized. So that just means that it's wiggling in one direction. There's a preferred plane for that wiggle to happen in. And in polarimetry, what we're doing is we're measuring that preferred plane, and we're looking for light that has been polarized by something, um, depending on what you're studying, you know, stars or gas or galaxies or planets. So there's actually two kinds of polarization. Um, you can have linear polarization, um, which is when it's wiggling in the preferred plane like I showed you before, but there's also a kind of polarization called circular polarization. And you can think of that just like linear polarization, except it's twisting as it's moving towards you, right? So it's kind of doing this as it's coming at you. Right, so the question that must be in your head is why would we use polarimetry anyway? As Jamie was sort of pointing out before, it's giving you spatial information. It's giving you an angle as well as an intensity. So it's uh, the, the fact that it's wiggling just in one plane is giving you some sort of spatial information. Uh, it can help you resolve shapes without, uh, or it can help you figure out the shape of things without having to resolve the objects. So we're always trying to improve resolving power in astronomy. And you can overcome some of that issue by using polarimetry. You can uh, null the star. In some cases, um, stars won't produce polarized light, which is really great if you're trying to look at something dim like a planet. And the most important reason to use polarimetry, Jamie says it's the best thing ever. So, <laughs> so what's happening? Why are things polarizing? You're starting with something like a star, like if it's sort of the sun or some very simple star like that that's a source of unpolarized light, and that light is wiggling, that electric field that we were talking about is wiggling in whatever direction it wants, and then it goes through an atmosphere. Excuse me? Taylor! <laughs> <laughs> My name's Kim. <laughs> um, okay, so it's going through an atmosphere, or it's bouncing off of an ocean or something like that, and some magic happens, and then it oscillates just along that plane after that. So it becomes polarized, and it's giving you that directional information when you observe it, as well as its intensity. So just to really drive this home, no pun intended, we can think about it in terms of, of a car. <laughs> um, so with a normal telescope, you're just sort of measuring the intensity of the light in most cases. With polarimetry, you're measuring the intensity and its direction, some angular information about the light. So if you think about driving a car, you have a speed that you're going, whoops, a doodle. <laughs> you have a speed that you're going, maybe you're going 60 kilometers per hour, um, and that's just the intensity. But if you have your vector, Victor, then you're going north at 60 kilometers per hour. You have that extra information, which is why polarimetry is so great. You get bonus information. 
that can help you do science. So that's why we use polarimetry. We're going to move on to where would we use it. So we actually use polarimetry, or a lot of us do in our everyday lives. You might use polarized light um, with your sunnies uh, or sunglasses, and you might uh, use it when you watch a 3D movie as well. <laughs> so sunnies, it's Australian for sunglasses. Uh, if, you, if you go to the beach and you have polarized sunglasses, you might, you might take them off and hold them up, and if there's a lot of glare coming off the water, your polarized sunglasses will cancel that out. It'll, it'll erase that polarized light. But because this is directional information that we're getting from polarized light as well as intensity, if you turn your glasses to the side, it'll let that polarized light through. It'll let that glare that glint through because that's polarized light, the polarized light that's bouncing off the water. So just um, if you guys want, uh, light from computer monitors and your laptop screens is also polarized. And I have a pair of polarized sunglasses. If you want, after the talks and the laptops are still on, you can come up and rotate them. And you can see, you'll be able to see um, at some angles the screen. And at other angles, it'll look completely black because it's filtering out all the light. Um, so if you want to, you can do that later. But the other place that you really uh, use this a lot in your life is when you go to a 3D movie. Um, and uh, so Avatar was the first uh, major movie in 3D. Um, Kim and I give it two thumbs down. Neither of us liked it. So that's, that's our review of the movie. And I heard they're just coming. They're coming out with like four new ones. Why? I don't know. They're coming with four new ones. Um, but uh, you might also use it in gaming. There are some games nowadays that um, you can wear special glasses for and also do it in 3D. So how does that work? Um, what happens is they project two images on the screen, um, and your glasses allow one, just one of those images to come through to each eye. So there's going to be a filter in one front of one of your eyes that lets all of the light that's wiggling up and down go to one eye, and all of the, the light that's wiggling horizontally going to the other eye. And in fact, if you go to an IMAX movie, that's what's happening. You're using linearly polarized light to see the, the, the movie. And if you move your head a little bit and tilt it, because you're you know an hour and a half through the movie and you're a little tired of holding your head straight, um, you'll notice that you'll lose the 3D effect of the movie. You won't see it anymore. It's because your, your glasses are not lined up with what's being projected on the screen anymore. But if you go to just a regular movie theater, um, and you watch a regular movie in 3D there, um, they use circularly polarized light instead. So one of your eyes is seeing light that is coming at you clockwise, and the other eye is seeing light that's coming at you counterclockwise. And so if you go to a regular theater, and not an IMAX theater, you can move your head, you can relax, and you can save a few dollars and get a better movie experience. Uh -huh. <laughs> just a tip. <laughs> But what do, we, how do we, what do we do in astronomy with polarimetry? Well, we do a lot of things. Basically, anything that you can study in astronomy, we're using polarimetry for. Um, one of the things we do is we look at the cosmic microwave background with polarimetry to basically try to determine what the shape of the universe is and where inflation happens a little bit faster and a little bit slower. We look at galaxies to try to determine how the black holes that are in the center of them are oriented and how the jets are compared to the galaxy itself. We can map the structure of the ISM, and so if you, um, I don't know if people in the back can see it. The interstellar medium. Yeah, oh, sorry. It's the dust the between the stars. Medium. Yes, you can see um, structure and lines for, uh, in the inter interstellar medium, and in fact, you can also use polarimetry to determine how the little dust grains are oriented, and if they're all lined up or randomly oriented uh, compared to um, other places in the, the interstellar medium. We'll be studying nebulae around stars to get their shapes. And we also look at stars themselves with polarimetry. We can determine if they're spherically shaped or a little bit oblong. We can better detect material that's in falling onto the central star or material that's being blown off of that star and determine what the shape is of um, all of that kind of stuff. Right, and we can also study debris disks. So this is, this is planets being formed. You can get an idea of their structure which side of them is closer to you. 
Um, and with planets, we can look at their atmospheres and surfaces. We can figure out if they have a blue sky like ours, if they have an ocean on them. And we can even study boring things like comets. This is a picture of Hale Hop. Um, it's a different uh, like ejection events of stuff fluffing off of the comet hale Bob, as seen in polarized light. So with that brief introduction to polarimetry, we are very happy to take any of your questions about the general idea of how polarimetry works before we get into the nitty gritty of what we do with it. Can you use any telescope to observe polarized light? You can, well, you can, yeah, you can use like radio telescopes and optical telescopes. You can look at different wavelengths. Uh, some telescopes are better geared for it. Um, and you need to put something, you need to have like the detector, you need to have a particular instrument called a polarimeter on the telescope, um, at least for optical telescopes, so that you can detect it. Yeah, in the radio, you just get it for free. Yeah. Um, and you don't have to have a special instrument necessarily like you do in optical. Anyone else? What causes the circular polarization? Oh, I got it. I got it. Magic! I'll try. Magic! What causes circular polarization? I mean, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, but there's a few different mechanisms. Um, yeah, so uh, Kim and I don't study the same exact things, but um, I study massive stars, and around massive stars, it's almost always caused by a magnetic field. So you can use circular polarization to map the actual magnetic field structure of a massive star, um, just like we could with the sun, except the sun is a lot closer and a lot easier uh, to do. Yeah, so that makes sense if you were thinking about that first slide that we showed, that you have the electric field wiggling and the magnetic field wiggling along with it perpendicular. That a magnetic field, if it's winding things up, that it could cause circularly polarized light. But we see it from other things like molecules can cause circularly polarized light. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Yields? Can you determine elements or the material of what you're looking at through polarization? Repeat the question. Can you determine elements or the material of what you're looking at through polarization? Um, yeah, in some ways. I mean, yes. yeah, that's, that's kind of part of the science that we're going to be talking about. Okay, um, so so if you have gas, um, gas is what we call, uh, if, if, if you're scattering with a hot electrons and hot gas, uh, so that's what we call a gray process because it doesn't matter what wavelength you're at, um, it scatters just the same. Uh, but dust scatters differently and there's a wavelength dependence. And so different kinds of dust have different kinds of wavelength dependence so you can back out information about the composition that way. Um, yeah. <laughs> we'll get into it. <laughs> uh, the, yes, in the back. In the back, gentlemen in the back. If something is literally polarizing light in, say, an up-down direction, how do you know it's actually polarizing it in that way, and not that you're just viewing it in the up-down orientation? So when you're measuring it, you're going to use something that would basically polarize the light itself. So it's like a, a filter that only lets light wiggling one way. So the way they often describe this is to think of like a picket fence and you have a rope going through it and you can wiggle the rope up and down to let the, the waves on the rope go through it. But if you tried to wiggle it side to side, it would stop it. So basically when we're measuring it, we're taking that fence or something that does the same sort of thing as that fence and turning it at different angles so we can see what the orientation is, uh, what angle that light is wiggling at, and see if it, you know, if it's wiggling a little bit in another direction as well. What's the effective distance of this? Like how far can you see? Well, I mean, like, we can look at the cosmic microwave background. It, it depends what wavelengths you're using to look at, at things. How long are we I don't want to run too fast. Okay, I'm sorry. That's it. There will be more time for questions. Then. All right, let's give a round of applause to our speakers. And here's your All right, so we're going to our speakers again.
shortly after we do a quick round of trivia. So we're going to switch over our slides to our trivia slides. If you have not gotten a trivia sheet and you would like one, please see our trivia czar, Tyler. He's up here in the front. And before we let you go for trivia, I just want to remind y'all that next month's event is going to be at 7 p.m. It's going to be 